Bonsoir. Good night. Welcome to the annual Massey Book Club Gala. Quel plaisir d'être ici avec vous ce soir. My name is Natalie DeRosier. I'm the principal of Massey College. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual gala that we're doing tonight. And what a pleasure it will be. What a treat. We're going to have senior fellow Margaret Atwood in conversation with our writer in residence, Susan Swan. And the evening will be moderated by the great incoming chair of our book club, the brilliant senior fellow, Lily Cho. So I just want to acknowledge as well that the physical place, Massey College in its physical structure is located on indigenous, indigenous land, the cherished land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are so grateful for the ability to continue to celebrate their stewardship of the land. Massey College is about intergenerational discourse. And tonight, we will not uh, have the, we will not go away without hearing from a junior fellow. So the first performance, the first artistic performance tonight will be by a junior fellow, the very talented Jennifer Tran. Jennifer is a saxophonist. Uh, she's Vietnamese Canadian from Brampton. She's very proud of that. She performs in Brampton as a young artist at, in part of their chamber music concert. She's also the soprano saxophonist of Dialectica, an all-female quartet who performs original Canadian music. And their work recently was used by Atome Goyan's newly released film Guest of Honor in, at the Toronto International Film Festival. Jennifer is pursuing her Masters of Music in saxophone performance at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Dr. Wallace Holliday. She will be performing César Franck, Allegretto, Poco Mosso, Bonne soirée à tous, enjoy your evening, Jennifer.
Welcome back. Good evening and welcome again to the Massey College 2020 Spring Book Club Gala. My name is Lily Cho and it is my great pleasure to welcome you back. I'm honored to carry on this tradition as the incoming chair of the book club, a club that began in 1998, founded by the inimitable Susan Sandra Martin. And before I introduce the true stars of our evening, I would like to take a moment uh, for some special thank yous. First, to those of you who joined us every month this year, the Massey Book Club members, to talk about books and ideas, thank you. This gal is the culmination of your ideas, your wit, and your intelligence. Next, to Angela Ferrante, the outgoing chair of the book club, thank you for the generosity and, uh, and depth of your leadership. Lastly, I'd like to take a moment uh, to recognize an essential member of our book club committee who couldn't join us tonight, uh, Ivan McFarlane. Ivan passed away on February 16th. Ivan shaped our reading with the depth of his wit and his fierce intelligence. He loved a powerful book and a good single malt. He radiated kindness. He and his beautiful wife Harriet gave so much to, the life, to life at Massey. If you could please take a moment, find a glass and join me in raising a glass to Ivan. To Ivan, thank you. We miss you and I can't imagine how we're going to choose next year's book list to you. Could I have some water? And now, let me introduce the stars of this evening's gala, Susan Swan and Margaret Atwood. Susan Swan is a novelist, teacher, activist, and journalist. Her impact on the Canadian literary and political scene has been far-reaching. This year, Swan published her eighth book of fiction, The Dead Celebrities Club, described in the Globe and Mail as a tale of greed, hubris, and fraud, a financial fable worthy of the age. Her award-winning first novel, The Biggest Modern Woman of the World, about a Canadian giantess who exhibited with P.T. Barnum, is currently being made into a television series. Susan Swan is a retired humanities professor from York University and was York's Robart Scholar for Canadian Studies in 1999. She has just finished her term as writer-in-residence at Massey College, which is sponsored by the University of Toronto's Department of English. Margaret Atwood is author of more than 50 books of fiction, poetry, critical essays, and graphic novels. Her latest novel, The Testaments, is a co-winner of the 2019 Booker Prize. It is the long-awaited sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, now an award-winning TV series. Her other works of fiction include Cat's Eye, Alias Grace, which won the 1996 Giller Prize, and the Premio Mondello in Italy. The Blind Assassin, winner of the 2000 Booker Prize, and the Mad Adam Trilogy, as well as Hagseed. She is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade, the Franz Kafka International Literary Prize, the Penn Center USA Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Los Angeles Times Innovators Award. Welcome, Susan and Margaret. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Lily, and welcome to everybody who is uh, watching us tonight and to the Massey Book Club members for putting on this great event, and to Margaret, who is joining us to talk about the Testaments this evening. I think it's very auspicious, Margaret, that today is May 1, and May Day is the uh, name for the resistance um, against Gilead in your new novel, The Testaments. And I wanted to start by asking you, probably something you've been asked before, but people have pestered you for years to write a sequel to your acclaimed novel, The Handmaid's Tale. What made you change your mind? Well, Susan, um, when they suggested a sequel what they meant of course was that I would continue the story on from the moment at which it ends in The Handmaid's Tale and that I would be using the same narrative voice and that really wouldn't have been 
impossible for me to do because I would have been in the position of imitating myself um, an earlier book, and it would have been very hard to recreate that. So I said no for quite a long time. And then the social situation changed. So I wrote the first book in 1985 in the middle of a uh, right-wing pushback against 70s uh, feminist activism and achievements. So along came the 80s, and then we had Ronald Reagan, and we had the rise of the religious right. So I thought, okay, if this is what people really mean, that they would like women to stay at home, how are they going to get them to do that? And also, if there were to be a totalitarianism in the United States, what kind of totalitarianism would it be? Yeah, it wouldn't party, you know, at a you know. dinner party, how mm -hmm. would it play out? How yeah. would it play out? Yeah. So this it wouldn't wouldn't be communism. Just a hint, um, at least. <laughs> so so we have thought for years. Yeah, um, but it would be more likely to be some form of um, religious fundamentalism. Uh, claiming to reestablish the kingdom of God upon earth, which was what the original 17th century Puritans had in mind. So I went back to the 17th century for a lot of inspiration for the original book. Uh, so then things changed. In the 90s, we seemed to be moving away from The Handmaid's Tale. The Iron Curtain came down in 89, and then all of a sudden, History was over, so we were told, and we and we were going to go shopping forever. And uh, that era ended in 2001 with the Twin Tower event. So then we were in a new era, and as we approached the 2016 election, we were in a really new era, or shall we say, a really old era that had come back again. Mm. And I thought, well, let us look at the story from another point of view, or from several other points of view. Um, someone with someone within Gilead in a position of relative power, and two young women, one of whom has grown up within Gilead, and one of whom has grown up across the border, um, right right around where we live, Susan. <laughs> That's right. More or less in the city. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and, and let us follow the story from, from those three points of view and take a look at how a regime such as uh, Gilead totalitarianism might begin to end. It doesn't end, but it begins to end. It starts to crumble. That it is the beginning of the crumbling. I was interested to know um, the actress Anne Dowd, who plays Aunt Lydia, is just spectacular in the series, uh, The Handmaid's Tale. What role did she have in, in influencing you in this new, you know, sequel? Was she, a, was she a force or an influence when you were creating Aunt Lydia? To, to a certain extent. I, I did a, a scene in the first uh, season of The Handmaid's Tale in which I am uh, let us put it this way, there aren't very many roles in that series for people of my age. <laughs> and the roles that there are are, are, are somewhat unpleasant. Um, so I am an aunt in the series, and I do wallop Elizabeth, Elizabeth Moss over the head. Uh, they added a sound effect, and we had to shoot it four times because apparently I wasn't doing it forcefully enough. I, I just say that so you don't think I really bopped her. Um <laughs> yeah, I remember being hit, very... Hit me harder, she said. No, yeah. no, no, I'll hurt you. No, yeah. no, go on, give me a whack. Uh, so it was like that. So I saw Anne Dowd um, in full flight as Aunt Lydia on that occasion, and she certainly was galvanizing. And um, she, she, from her end, because uh, I saw her this fall, and she said, I was praying for there to be, please, more Aunt Lydia. And my prayers were answered. So she she does the voice on the audiobook and she is spectacular and and she came to London and helped us launch the book. So let us say that there is a connection there. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Uh, I came up with the uh, book before I had had these experiences, but um, Anne Dowd certainly reinforced what I was doing because her Aunt Lydia is quite complex, 
as are, as are all the characters that she plays. So Anne Dowd was a bit of a subliminal presence as you were oh, writing. Not just subliminal. I mean, she was liminal. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> I was exactly. quite aware of her, and I, and I really hoped that she would read the audiobook, which she did, and I really hoped that she would turn up in London and help us launch the book, which she did, and she walked on the stage as Anne Dowd, and then she did some weird thing and turned into Aunt Lydia before our very eyes. I guess it's called acting. No, it, it is called acting, and it is it is magic, though, isn't it? it just she's, uh, she's very good. It made me uh, remember, I went to a girls' boarding school, which is um, a kind of a shadow kingdom in a way, and uh, the head of our boarding school, her nickname was Stainless Steel, and she uh, was by turn wonderfully charming and interesting, and then by another turn, uh, absolutely terrifying. The girls used to pound their, uh, put their, pound their hands on the desk when she walked by, when she was coming down the hall as a warning that went out. And I thought, uh, of course, this woman, um, this powerful figure in this kind of fiefdom of girls, she took a liking to me. So I, I uh, tried to hide this from the other girls by doing things like putting on nail polish and study hours so that I'd be called in for a detention. But what was so interesting, um, when I read the Testaments, Aunt Lydia completely captures that type of sort of severe female leader who can unexpectedly suddenly do something nice. And then at the next turn, uh, you know, you, you think you're going to be strung up by your heels. So you did a really uh, wonderful job with Aunt Lydia. Did you find models for her in your own family or, or at school? Not my family, heaven for a um, yeah. No. no. <laughs> uh, well, I can think of a couple of high school teachers, but they're, they're not in the same category. I mean, the, the real model for her is Richard III, if you must know. Um, yeah. but, but he's kind of worse than she Yes. So uh, he doesn't have any redeeming sides, but he, he begins much the same way that she does. Hi, I'm Richard III, and I'm really bad. And now I'm going to let you watch me being bad. I would never have guessed that. But what I, when I was preparing for this interview, I reread the two novels, and I was struck by the similarity between The Handmaid, June, or Offred, and Aunt Lydia because they both, they're not traditional witnesses or victims, they're not traditional victims, they both say, I'm, I'm going to survive this, I, you know, I'm not going to be taken down by it. And I wondered, was there some kind of familial or psychological connection between Aunt Lydia and Alfred? Oh, and I think just what you said, and, and anybody who finds themselves in that position um, is either going to say this is this is just the most horrible, terrible thing, and I cannot deal with it. Yeah. They're either going to say that, or okay, I get it. I see what's going on, and and I am just going to um, tough it out. And I see what the games are that are being played. I see what you have to do to play them, and and therefore I will do that. It's not that they approve of it. That's not what is at issue, but. Um, when I first published The Handmaid's Tale, I had some younger people uh, saying things like, well, well, why didn't they have a march? You know, why didn't they protest? And I said, you, you obviously haven't really looked at totalitarianisms. You will notice that after the first six months, the opposition to Hitler was gone. Why was that? Because we killed them. <laughs> yeah. You, you don't, Fairly you, simple. under a regime like that, you don't, um, come out in the open and say, I object to what you're doing. You, you can only do that in a democracy. So in a real autocratic totalitarianism, you do that and, and you're gone. Very true. Do you see the Hula TV series as a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale? A sequel. It's, it's a continuation of, but it is a television series. So it must meet the demands of, of that form. And one of the demands of that form is the same as the demands for a serial novel in the 19th century. So Dickens wrote in serial form, 
a number of his novels. And in those novels, you'll notice that at the end of every third or so chapter, there is a cliffhanger because that was the demand of the form. And you will notice that at the end of each episode of The Handmaid's Tale, there is a cliffhanger because that is the demands of the form. So The Handmaid's Tale is pretty inner. It's a, it's, a lot of it takes place inside her head. We're listening to her voice, but we're not seeing her act out because if you act it out, off with your head. Um, in a television series, it's hard to sustain that. You have to have events. You have to have actions. Every and so there are, there are a lot more actions. She becomes a more active person. Um, she pulls a number of capers that probably would have got her strung up, strung up, strung up on a meat hook if, if you had tried them in a real totalitarianism. But, but you have to have um, those kinds of events in a television series. Because we have to want to know what's going to happen next. And you are an executive or consulting producer, are you not? Can you what tell does that mean, Susan? Now, <laughs> what does what? that actually mean? Does yeah. it mean I have any power? No. It means that I get to talk to Bruce Miller, an affable uh, person who is the showrunner. Uh, I get to read the scripts. I get to make notes on them. I get to... Um, I get to send in those notes. Does it mean that those notes will be obeyed? It does not mean that. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm, I'm what it says, a consulting um, something or other. Um, so I get consulted, but that doesn't mean I am obeyed. I'm not she who must be obeyed. The, the people in control of the final product in a television series are the producers. So well, the director, then the producers. The thing, I mean, we writers don't don't make TV series as a as a rule. So there's always that danger that the writer thinks that it can be duplicated exactly as the book. Is there not? Well, I worked in film and television in the '70s, so I I I, I started off with the knowledge that that was not true. Mm -hmm. And there are two different forms that they have their own ways of being good. Uh, but they're not the same ways. And so, so there was a film made of Under the Volcano. Did you ever see it? No, I didn't you see ever it. read the book. So the book is very complex. It's, it's extremely layered. It has, you know, symbolism piled upon symbolism. It's got um, multi-dimensional things going on, and it's very rich. It's very, has a lot of depth. Um, they made it into a movie, and the movie was about a drunk. That's it. That's it. That's so those, those very inner, those <laughs> very uh, inward stories with a lot of layers are hard to do uh, in those forms. Well, you I, can do a lot of things in them, but but you can't do that. It's just very hard. A tear rolling down a cheek on a on a film screen is quite different than a tear rolling down a cheek in in a page of prose. It's such a visceral form. But I wanted to ask you about uh, The Handmaid's evolution from, from a witness, basically. Uh, June or Offred is kind of a witness. She is, yes, she's going to survive. But then in the Hula series, she becomes a real revolutionary. And I, I wondered if you had a hand in that and what you thought nope. of evolution. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> nope, you're talking to the wrong person here. Okay. Uh, yeah, as I say, I'm a, I'm a consultant, but I'm not an initiator. And uh, there, there are usually about ten writers working on this, and um, and they have they work in the writing room, and it is a closed job. You you don't see anything that comes out of it until they have um, had their conversations, had their had their arguments, whatever they may be, and 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 have a script to show you. And once those scripts appear, they typically go through about six versions, if not more, before they're shot. I have been through this with The Wives of Bath, the movie that was made uh, on my novel about a girls' boarding school. And I, the only power I had was to uh, cancel the option if I didn't like the script. And I did yeah. do that, mm -hmm. actually. Oh, you canceled it. Oh, yeah. dear. Just I just thought, what's the point of having a really bad uh, movie made of my book? Uh, it doesn't make sense. And I'm really glad I did. But that was a, you know, a lesson. That was the only yeah, real... Yeah, I, I didn't have that. I did not even have that power because the rights to a television series went, right. series went with the 1989 movie. 
So the history of that is they made the 1989 movie, uh, which was sold to a distributor. The distributor then went bankrupt. The assets were dispersed. And for about um, 25 years, nobody knew who had them. So it was a lot like Lord of the Rings. The <laughs> television rights to the <laughs> Handmaid's Tale went into the mountain with Gollum and disappeared from view. And until Frodo came along, or was it Bilbo? I forget. It was Bilbo. Bilbo? Yes, it was Bilbo. Till Bilbo came along and went into the mountain, nobody actually knew. And I, I think one one day MGM opened a drawer, and lo and behold, um, there were the rights to The Handmaid's Tale. But but several entities approached us over the years and said, "Can we do this?" And I said, "I really don't know who has the rights." So that is the story of that. So I did not have the ability to cancel anything because those rights had gone in 89, and at that point, nobody thought it would ever be made because what was the television series then? It was Dallas, or it was daytime soaps. And that was kind of it. There, there were beginning to be some, some six-part series of things like Jane Eyre, but um, the, the upmarket streamed television series did not exist, so I just thought, this is never going to happen, so goodbye. And how wrong you were. How wrong I was. And how lucky I was, because it could have been really horrific. But as it was, it, it landed with people who really wanted to make a good show and wanted to be faithful to the material. And they followed the same rule that I followed with the book, the books, which is uh, nothing goes in that doesn't have a precedent in, in history. So you can't just make up grisly gore. Uh, there has to be real, <laughs> there's no shortage, um, but but they have to show that there are precedents to what they're putting in. I didn't know they'd done that with the series. Um, yep, 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 yep. They've got researchers. Uh, anybody says, this would never happen. The person has to be there to say, well, it did happen, and here's when. That, that's very distressing, because there was a lot of terrible stuff in the the uh, television series, but anyway. Uh, yeah, not nearly as terrible as the stuff that, that exists in real life, believe me. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so yeah, but if you um, if you joined Amnesty in 1970, as, as I did, uh, you saw a lot of that, uh, the terrible stuff in the last 30 years of the 20th century. Uh, one of the reasons we, we started Penn Canada uh, was that those that terrible stuff was going on in other countries then and had been doing. And you know that Penn International uh, was first formed as a sort of gentleman's tea party, but, but then along came uh, European fascism, and that's when they became politically active. Well, it's uh, very, very interesting the way that you have you appear to have kept in mind what happened in the television series in Testaments. Were you very conscious when you were writing the Testaments of, of um, a responsibility to the television viewers of the series? How did you handle that? So okay, so so the thing is, the Testaments takes place 16 years later. Mm-hmm. Um, how clever of me. Um, but, it, but it had to be so that there couldn't be a conflict. So in instances where they had got in there ahead with the name, I had to use that name. Uh, it couldn't, otherwise it would just get too confusing. Uh, but, but really that's, that's about it. So I, I didn't want to be in conflict with the series, but I didn't want to be rewriting the series on the page either. So it was like that. And, and they were, uh, the publishers of the novel were so assiduous that they actually got some beleaguered soul to watch all of the television series and read both of the books and inter-annotate them. Oh my God. In case there was a conflict. That makes making charts and graphs to a new level. That's unbelievable. They did it. They wow. did all of that. Yeah, they were very attentive. And you didn't have to do it. I didn't have to do it, but I, but I didn't. Um, I, I kind of knew that it was okay. So they didn't, in fact, find any places where I was in violent conflict with the series. 
I think uh, the Testaments has one of the great escape narratives um, uh, of all time. I've all, often thought that Casanova's escape from the the leads, the Venetian prison. Yes, one if, the, he, if, if he ever did that. <laughs> if he ever did that. He was a terrible liar, as you know. I, I know he was, but but he uh, tells it very, very convincingly. And yes. one moment where he's he's got an iron bar and he's he's uh, uh, knocked a hole in the bottom of his cell that he's going to escape through, and then they move him to a new cell. And your mm -hmm. narrative, the two young uh, women who are leaving, fleeing Gilead, um, has those moments too. There's the sort of trip by the bus, then the trip down the river, then they get picked up in a big vessel. Um, and no, then, no, no spoilers, Susan. No, I won't tell the end. But it just has these twists and turns, which you sort of, ex ex you know, hope or uh, anticipate in a, an escape narrative. And I wondered if you had done some kind of study of escape narratives uh, when you were working on that part of the book. Um, not a study as such, but of course all, all of one's adolescent reading. I mean, there's quite a lot of it. Um, but the the area that I chose, so Bangor, Maine was a, a jumping off point for the um, Underground Railroad. So people escaping from slavery. Um, there, were, there were Quakers in that town who would hide people out. And then, of course, there's this long river that goes up and then, and then it goes out into the ocean and you're quite close to Canada. So that whole main coast and Campobello Island was a hangout for smugglers <laughs> quite a long time. So mm -hmm. there's, there's been a, a lot of, um, there've been a lot of smuggling going on back and forth there for, for years and years and years. So it, it seemed evident to me that the, population would be quite um, smuggler positive and and it yes it comes off very well in in the novel that they the characters that help them are are very convincing although you're never quite sure if they're going to betray them which is part of a great escape narrative too yeah well they're in it, well of course and any good smuggler always has a financial upside don't they that's right now, Aunt Lydia hides her testament or confession in Cardinal Newman's autobiography, um, Pro Vita Sua, Defense of My Life. Apo me, Apologia, uh, Pro okay. Vita Sua. Thank you. Uh, was religion part of your life growing up? That's not something I know about you. Mm, yes and no. So uh, my parents were scientists, and they felt that children should choose for themselves once they were grown up. So they were actually quite alarmed when I wanted to go to Sunday school because they felt I might get brainwashed in it. No hope of that. Um, it was mostly the Sunday school teacher discussing um, outfits and fashion with the little girls in the class. Uh, but I did win the, you'll get a chuckle out of this, I did win the prize for memorizing the most verses. <laughs> most verses Bible verses yeah so Psalms and what have you and I also won a prize for writing the best temperance essay illustrated about why you shouldn't drink would you like to know why yes I would the reason you shouldn't drink is that if you drink uh, the capillaries in your nose get enlarged and then if you go out into the snow and fall over in it you have a much better chance of freezing to death because all of your your blood is circulating through your capillaries. So this was all illustrated um, quite convincingly, and, and that is why you should not drink, Susan. Okay, we should talk about what we've been doing uh, during the lockdown. And I've had uh, been finishing my workshop, and my students have put together a video uh, for YouTube of little snapshots of their readings and, and they're shot in their homes, in their bedroom, because of course they're in quarantine. And you can find the link to the, the videos um, on the description of the YouTube, the YouTube um, clip. But you have been busy. What, what's it called, Susan? What's the YouTube clip called? Stories from the Round Room. Because Stories have, from the Round Room. So you go to YouTube, you put in Stories from the Round Room and you'll find it. That's right, you will. Yeah, okay. And, and uh, 
the puppet show that we can't see, but you did for the BBC. You'll um, be able to see it quite soon. Oh, okay. Fashion moment. On your map. <laughs> well, you have a few slides of the, um, of the puppets. Thank you. Uh, the Mask of the Red Death. Can you by, tell by us? By Edgar Allan Poe. I guess I should take this off. Anyway, my sister sewed it. Don't you think it's very attractive? It's very, very beautiful. It's very floral. Yes, it has a little pocket on the inside so you can put a filter in there. Both of my earbuds fell out. All right. Well, um, you're still visible. Okay, here we go. Okay, Edgar Allan Poe. So what happened was that uh, Mary Beard, the two-fisted classicist from Cambridge in England, said, uh, have you got anything sort of plague-related that you could do for us? So my sister was coming in to visit on the weekends, and we decided to do The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe with tableware. So in this slide, you see Prince Prospero played by a champagne bottle, and these are the courtiers who are played by wine glasses upside down. If you look at their hats, you can see that there's Prince Prospero. He's got a knife. Because in the uh, penultimate scene, he, he has to pull his knife on the Red Death. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, and this these, are, these are the furnishings of his, of his hideout, which is a fortified abbey. So he's well supplied against the plague. He's got a sufficient booze plus hand sand and toilet paper, which is what you need, you must admit. <laughs> and uh, that is, of course, a tarot card. Um Death Tarot card number thirteen, and the story. That's the that's the uh, sinister clock that is in the seventh room of Prince Prospero's Abbey when he's where he's throwing a party in rooms of different colors, beginning with blue. This this is the Red Death making his entrance. He comes in as a costumed person at the party, but he's he's put on an offensive costume. He's dressed himself up as the Red Death, and everybody takes objection to that. And uh, this is the part where the courtiers uh, jump on him to see who's inside his costume, and there's nobody there. And then they all collapse. And exactly. you can see the, the clock has stopped at five past midnight. <laughs> well, I think it was very clever of you to have picked that theme since we're living it. And I wanted to ask you, we're sort of at a, a still point in the world right now, sort of the newest Stundel, I think it was called in Germany after the Second World War, where we're at a new beginning. What hope do you have for us uh, in terms okay. of change? Vi viruses like this eventually come to an end. So either people do develop immunity to them or we develop a vaccine and enough people... Uh, then are not passing it on, so it doesn't circulate anymore. So we will get out the other side. And uh, people are saying, well, will we get back to normal? And I am saying, it won't be what we thought was normal before. It will become a, a different sort of normal, but we won't be sitting inside our houses all the time. Is, is, that, is that hopeful? <laughs> that, that, that's hopeful. Thank you, Margaret. You'll, you'll be playing golf again, Susan. Well, uh, I think they do play golf, you know, uh, in some of the courses, but that's another story. We have to go to Lily now. Hello. Welcome back. Uh, thank you, Margaret and Susan, especially Susan. And Margaret, thank you because we are about to go into a second round of questions. And I know that you're not a stranger to Massey College. And if this had not been a virtual gala, I want you to imagine yourself in the dining hall. The candles have burned down a little. And this is the part of the evening where we invite members of the Massey community to ask you questions. And it is my great privilege to share some of their questions with you now. Um, we have time for a few. And our first question is from Gilbert Reed. And he asks, is the coronavirus a good example of speculative fiction in action? Well, um, there have been a number of sci-fi novels and, and um, spec fics. Um, 
based on pandemic plagues, but that is because there have been a number of pandemic plagues in history. So this is not a new experience for humanity. There was the Red Death, which is, of course, what Poe based his story on. What am I saying? The Black Death, which Poe based his story, the Red Death, on. Um, and going back before that time, there were a number of plagues in the classical world. There were some biblical ones, uh, and there were uh, some that occurred here and there that we don't quite know what they were. Uh, people describe them, but pe but there is no knowledge of what they actually were. So, and more recently in our history, there was the 1919 uh, so-called Spanish flu, which was devastating. So, yeah, we've had them before, and let us mention that when Europeans landed on them, on the Americas, they brought with them all a lot of germs to which nobody living here then had any immunity whatsoever. So the mortality rate was very high. Uh, so it's something that has happened to people before. And it's something that happens in the animal world all the time. So, so let us say it's not fiction. It's that the fact that fiction has drawn on these events, um, but they didn't invent such things. Thank you. I, I, I'm desperate to follow up, but I'm under strict orders to, <laughs> to, 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 to bring you many questions. And, and um, as a note to our audience, I, I want you to know that uh, we've received a cascade of questions. We're so grateful for all of you for contributing such uh, brilliant and interesting questions. I unfortunately am only going to be able to ask a couple more. Uh, and our next question is for Mylene O'Connor. And she would like to know, if you could comment on your reaction to the ban on abortions in some U.S. states and the situation in the testaments, um, the ban because of the virus or the or the virtual ban before that. I I, I believe she left the question open, and so I would like you should take a okay, take so a stab there, at either one. <laughs> there there isn't a complete ban in any states exactly, because it is against the Supreme Court ruling, but but some states have taken the the virus as an excuse for saying, well, of course, you, you can't do anything near a hospital or a clinic or anything like that. Uh, so I would just say, you know, opportunity is always seized if you have, a, if you have an agenda, and um, that's their agenda. And other people in other parts of the world are using it as an excuse for asserting more authoritarian control and uh, getting getting hold of your phone. If you don't want anybody tracing your movements, you better throw your phone in the lake uh, because it's 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 very phone centric. This <laughs> this tracing these days. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And so, don't before you throw your phone in the lake. A couple more questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We still need you for a little longer, uh, but yeah, it, absolutely. Uh, I mean, in fact, this next question anticipates uh, your comment. Uh, it's a question from David Reichs, and he asks, do you consider your books to be prophecy in that, and he defines it as being bound to happen, prophecy is something that's bound to happen, or projection, that is something that you put out there in the hopes of a different outcome? I would say the second, because um, you you cannot actually predict the future. There there isn't any the future. There are a number of of uh, possible futures, but we do not know which one we're going to get uh, witness this year. So who could have prophesied that there was going to be a a pandemic virus? If you'd if somebody had said that to you last September, uh, a number of people would have said, "Well, yeah, sometime, maybe." Uh, and epidemiologists have been saying it for years. They they could say what, but they couldn't say when. So so sure, prophecy in that it's 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 a num it's it's among the probabilities, but you can't say exactly when. So I would say they're more like um, two roads diverged in a yellow wood. One of them leads to, leads to this uh, dystopia that I have described. Maybe you should take the other one. <laughs> <laughs> If you don't want to live there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll always look for the other road, as advised by Margaret Atwood. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, uh, 
this answer also leads me to a composite uh, of, of many questions that we've received. And, and that does have to do with the role of fiction in the moment uh, that we now inhabit, uh, given that the events that are unfolding all around us have a hyper-real or surreal quality. Uh, many, many people are wondering what you think of as the role of fiction, of reading fiction, of entering other worlds, given mm. the, the, the reality we seem to be in. All right, so there, there isn't any one the fiction. There are all different kinds of fiction. Um, so some people read for escape. Um, I noticed that the um, next book up on the Globe and Mail Reading Club is going to be Kathy Reichs, who, who has the series having to do with the forensic um, a, a sort of corpse investigating detective. <laughs> so is that escape? Or is it, what, what exactly is it? Um, so, so you can escape to another world where things are, are better than here. You can escape to another one where things are worse. Uh, you can travel to the past, read Edith Wharton, where the r rules of society were quite different from the way they are now. Uh, you can go to literature uh, from another country. You're not going to be traveling much, but you can travel that way. Uh, and it, all of these are fiction, and they all fulfill a, a different role. So... If, if you're very anxious, you might want to read a book in which things are much worse than they are for you. And you'll think, well, at least it's not that bad. Or you might think, well, I don't want to read that because it will make me even more anxious. <laughs> On the other hand, if you're bored, you might want to re read a peppy adventure story. Your choice. There's lots of choice. And reading, by the way, is way up right now. If we're reading a lot of books, you get a lot of requests for reading lists from people. So I take from that that fiction remains extraordinarily powerful. I mean, I, I, as somebody who teaches English literature courses to undergraduates year in and year out, I, I, I sometimes have this moment where I feel like I have to persuade everybody that it's still very important to read things that are supposedly not real. <laughs> and yet here we are. And so I think, uh, so thank you for that. Well, they, prob they probably have changed their mind somewhat now that they're stuck in their own. <laughs> <laughs> now that they don't have a lot of choices of other things to do. Uh, so there is no mass barbecue on the beach. Sorry, folks. Uh, maybe it's time to read War and Peace. Well, or, or watch uh, many adaptations of novels you've already loved. You, you, you can do that, but, but it, can, it can get tiring after a while, as people are finding. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, you know, I, we, we have been looking at each other for some, for, for nearly an hour. So I'm actually going to bring us closer to the close of our evening. And there are two, there, there's one more question I'd like to share. And then, uh, and then our, 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 our last sort of event, which will be a, a book draw to those of you who are out there in the audience, hang on to your ticket numbers, uh, which you got with your reservation. Uh, but that's that's coming. I'm foreshadowing. But first, a question. Last question from Ava Salinas, and this is a a, a more personal question, if you if you will. Uh, and she asks, "Can you tell us what is bringing you small joys or pleasures right now? Are they any different now than they were, say, three months ago, <laughs> or this <laughs> last year?" <laughs> yeah, three months. three months ago, I think we were right in the middle of winter. Um, so March 10th, I escaped by the hair of my tinny chin chin from, from Ireland. Um, I'd been in New Zealand, I'd been in Australia, the virus wasn't there yet, and it wasn't in Ireland when I was there, but it was almost there. So I came out on March the 10th, I went through Heathrow, it was empty. So I feel that I had a narrow escape. Uh, I got back, I self-isolated, that would be March since that time, the daffodils have come up. So I would say that my garden is a lot tidier this year than it often is. <laughs> and and I've, I've, I've done some baking. I actually hadn't done much baking for some time, but we all seem to be back in about 1948. So a lot of baking going on, a certain amount of handicrafts, and, um, and, some, and some vegetable growing. I actually have grown some things in in takeout containers from my local <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> you have to punch a hole in the bottom 
but they make really great um, seed starters with the transparent lids. You put the lid on, you have a little greenhouse, you put a um, tray of water underneath, and it's a good way of starting seeds. Uh, so that, and um, I'm busier really than than ever before, because why is that? Because lots of people want you to do these online things. Just, just saying. Well, I, I <laughs> we are so grateful that you're here and joining us tonight. And we are, and, and lots of people want you. They don't want just anybody. And it's partly because of the way in which you have always seen around the corner uh, in so many of the things that, and so many mm. moments that we're you, living in. Yeah, you win some, you lose some. I, I certainly have not got them all. Uh, and I, hang I, on to the I did not say. I did not say. I better not go to to Australia, New Zealand, and Ireland because I might get stuck. I, I didn't actually say that to myself. <laughs> well, we're so glad that you escaped, that you were able to join us, that you're here now, that you're growing seeds and baking, and that you've given us a small gardening lesson that was unlooked for in this gala evening. <laughs> And I, I'd like now to announce the, the final event of the evening, um, a digestif, if you will. It's a book draw sponsored by the House of Anansi Press for a signed copy of a limited edition hard copy of Margaret Atwood's 2008 Massey Lectures, Payback, Debt and the Shadow Side of Wealth. And Margaret, this is the action portion of the evening. Mm -hmm. I hope you're ready. Because yes. what we're going to ask... <laughs> this is so, a book that's got a really good pandemic in it, by the way. It's mm -hmm. in the last chapter. Uh, well, don't it. ruin the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but absolutely, I mean, speaking of seeing around the corner. Uh, so, so in terms of the action portion of the evening, uh, although many, many people RSVP, we've decided to reward the first 1,000 people who signed up for this gala with an opportunity... Well, more than a thousand are actually, I think we are looking at a couple thousand actually, <laughs> but, um, but the first thousand have the opportunity to win this book. And what we're going to ask you to do um, is to choose a number between one and 1,000. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know, and you can act on this in any way you want. <laughs> okay, I have my number. All right, we're ready. 696. 696. Okay, so the person who is holding the um, RSVP number 696, uh, you are our lucky winner tonight. On Monday morning, Massey College will email the person who is holding ticket number 696, our golden ticket for the evening, uh, for the, from this registration list to let them know that they've been selected as the recipient of the book and you will get more information to come. Congratulations. We are now at the final, final minutes, and I'm going to pass the stage back to Principal Berosier. Thank you so much, Susan and Margaret, for an extraordinary evening. And thank you. Thank you. What a fabulous evening. Thank you so much. Thank you to Lily Cho. Our great thanks to uh, Susan Swan and to Margaret Atwood. Thank you so much for having been there. And I want to thank also the, the staff from Massey College that made this happen. Uh, Matthew Grantfield, uh, Abra Rissi, Catherine Fowler, Emily Mockler. Thank you so much for uh, making this happen. And thank you to all of you for continuing to support Massey and, and being there. So I want to encourage you to stay safe Continue to watch uh, the Massey Dialogues and hope to see you soon after this pandemic. Thank you. Bonsoir.